In today's video, I spent over $140 on a variety of vanilla products and ran them through three different experiments to answer a simple question. And that is, is real vanilla actually worth it? Because if you take a walk down the vanilla aisle at the store and haphazardly pick a bottle, you could spend as little as $2 or all the way up to $48. And if you're like me, you probably have some questions that you want to be answered. For example, is there any difference between vanilla extract, vanilla paste, and vanilla beans? Or what about vanilla powder? Secondly, does Madagascan vanilla taste different compared to vanilla grown in Mexico? Or what about that Tahitian one? Third, does vanilla flavor get cooked out in a cookie compared to frosting? Or what happens when you add $4 worth of a vanilla bean to the batter for a single pancake? Okay, that's probably not something you wondered, but I got curious and decided to test it, so we'll have an answer to that as well. But as always, the most important question with all of this stuff is how big of a difference does it actually make? Because you have to keep in mind, pancakes or cookies without vanilla are still pancakes and cookies, whereas a marinara sauce without tomatoes is no longer a marinara sauce. And in making this video, I have a completely new respect and appreciation for vanilla. And I think the most important takeaway will actually not be the answer to the question, is real vanilla actually worth it? But what will deliver more value to you in the long term is understanding the food science behind how vanilla works. Before we dive in, a quick thank you to today's sponsor, Geico, who know a thing or two about the value of saving money. So check the link below. We'll talk a bit more about Geico later, but now let's break it down. And to start, I think it makes the most sense to answer this question. Why do we even add vanilla to food in the first place? Here's a sentence I want you to keep in the back of your mind throughout the rest of this video. As noted in On Food and Cooking, in order for herbs and spices to provide us with flavor, cooks must find ways to liberate the flavor chemicals from within their tissue and convey them to our taste and odor receptors. And this is the entire crux of the matter when it comes to vanilla and vanilla products. Vanilla's primary role influence how a dish smells, not how it tastes. For example, if you take a little bit of vanilla extract or vanilla bean and close your nose and, you know, sip it or take a bite, it doesn't taste like anything. It just tastes like I'm eating a stick. But as soon as I take a piece off with my nose, you actually are filled up with all those beautiful aromas and it's absolutely intoxicating. Still doesn't taste very good. It's pretty bitter actually. But the aroma compounds that vanilla products provide can be extracted, altered, or created through cooking and techniques which are going to influence the flavor of the final product, such as increasing the perceived sweetness of a dish or providing an overall aromatic lift. Now, there are actually a couple hundred aroma molecules in a single vanilla bean, but there is a single aroma molecule that shines far and above the rest, and that aroma molecule is called vanillin, and it looks like this. Now, vanillin, or vanillin, as I'll probably also call it once or twice in this video, actually will suggest on its own that, hey, I'm smelling vanilla right now. But there are two very important things that you need to keep in mind. The first is that naturally occurring vanillin in a vanilla bean is chemically the same as the synthetically produced vanillin used in imitation vanilla products. And then secondly, vanillin will exist in different concentrations in each vanilla product we are testing today. For example, in some testing done by America's Test Kitchen, they found that the imitation extracts had on average 15 times more vanillin than real vanilla extract. Now it's fair to note that a higher concentration of vanillin aroma molecules is not inherently better because guess what? Imitation vanilla is missing out on a couple hundred of those other aroma molecules that provide so much depth and complexity to the real thing. So we tend to think that a particular herb or spice has a distinctive and singular aroma. Cumin smells like cumin, mint smells like mint, or vanilla smells like vanilla. But each of these are actually several different aroma molecules that create a composite smell that our nose identifies as that specific herb or spice. For example, there are some similarities for sure, but in a side-by-side -side sniff test between some Mexican vanilla extract and that from Madagascar, it's pretty easy to tell that there are some different smells going on in each of these products. And actually, this table from Vanilla Pura has a taste profile guide 
from vanilla grown in different countries. And it's interesting to note here that Madagascar produces about 80% of the worldwide vanilla crop each year. So unless otherwise stated or specifically ordered, the stuff you get at the grocery store is almost certainly vanilla from Madagascar. And as a curious home cook, I wanna answer these questions when it comes to using vanilla in a blind taste test. First, does the real vanilla extract provide more depth of flavor than the imitation? Is the Mexican vanilla extract significantly different than the Madagascan? How much of a difference does the type and form factor of vanilla make? For example, does that paste with the flex of vanilla hold on to its flavor better? Or is this stuff all too nuanced to even make a difference? Now there's a lot more I want to explain with how aroma molecules work and some of the differences between these form factors. But first, let's just hop into experiment number one, and that is some vanilla frosting. The first test subject is vanilla frosting, and specifically I'm testing five different versions of American buttercream frosting. I made one large batch following Stella Parks' recipe, which is made by adding 340 grams of unsalted 65 degree butter to a bowl or stand mixer, along with 340 grams of powdered sugar, and then mixing those two until it's fully incorporated. Next, I added three grams of salt and continued to mix until it was airy and light. And normally you would add the vanilla at this stage, but I'm waiting to separate them out into the bowls. After about six minutes, I drizzled in 85 grams of heavy cream until it was light and fluffy. And here is where I separated and added the various vanilla products, which for this test were Mexican vanilla extract, a Madagascar vanilla extract, vanilla paste, vanilla powder, and the imitation vanilla flavoring, which is clear. Now I did not use the actual vanilla bean in this test. I'll get to why in a couple of minutes, but first let's just see if I can taste any differences between these. Okay, I'm uh, pretty interested to see how these things fall. So I'm gonna blindfold, switch them up, and uh, see if I can actually tell any differences between them. I'm actually probably most curious about vanilla paste, which is actually something I've never used or really never knew existed before starting this video. So. Kind of curious to see if this one comes through at all, but we'll see. One, two, three, four, five. All right, let's start with uh, number one. And I will say, tasted it earlier without the vanilla, and it kind of tastes a little gross, maybe just like sugar and butter. Once you add vanilla, it is shocking how much better that tastes. Number two. Ooh. Go back to number one. I, I don't know exactly know how to describe this yet, but I'm gonna say number two is less intense than number one. Number one's better in my opinion so far. That one's pretty good. I want to say there's kind of like a little bit of an aftertaste of this outside of just the pure vanilla flavor. So I wonder if that's one of the extracts. I don't know. Number four. This one's very clean tasting. I don't know. I'm, I'm going to have to go back through and, and kind of compare and contrast. Let me go to number five. I mean, number four was really good too. Or sorry, that was five. Let me go back to one. One. Five. Four. Two. All right, every time I go back to two, I feel like it gets worse. I don't know if that's because of like a palate fatigue, but the more I taste two, the more it tastes like artificial. Um, We'll see if it is the imitation, but yeah, that one's weird. Number three definitely has more like earthy kind of bottom notes, I would say. Also tastes like a little bit more kind of alcoholic. Um, so I'm gonna assume that's probably one of the extracts. This one tastes pretty solid. All of them are, all of them are passable. I would say the one that is worst is number two. Every time I go back to it, it, it tastes kind of worse and I get a little bit sick of it. It has like that kind of artificially type 
flavor. So I, I think this is the imitation. Number three also definitely sticks out. It's got more like under deeper tones to it. And I don't know if that's from like, if it's an extract but that's from the alcohol or if that's from like the vanilla itself, who knows. Um, four, five, and one are all fairly similar. Um, I feel like one has like a really clean vanilla flavor, but I would say one, four, and five are like basically even. Slight, three is like slightly lower for me. And then number two, I would say is definitely like a step below all of them. So let's see. So real vanilla extract, this is paste. You can still see it. Okay, so I liked four and five. Okay, three was the real vanilla from Mexico. That's interesting. Definitely some different notes in this one. Number two is the imitation, okay. And then one is the vanilla powder, interesting. Now disclaimer, I'm not a big like icing guy in general. I'm not the person who like eats it off. I'm the person who scrapes it off and leaves like a tiny bit with my cake or whatever. Um, so this was not like my favorite test to do. But what I'm really more interested in is how these vanillas are going to change when we actually start cooking with them in experiments two and three. And my personal favorite thing probably to use vanilla for would be pancakes and that's experiment number two. But before we get there, we need to talk about how aroma molecules work. So is real vanilla actually worth it? Well, for this specific frosting test, I definitely think it is. Even though this imitation is like $2 for the entire bottle, it's noticeably worse in my opinion. However, it would be a gross oversimplification for me to just stick to this one test because this is probably the third time in my life that I've made frosting and I only like it in small amounts, so I may be more sensitive than the average person. And second and more importantly, these vanilla flavor compounds and their concentrations will change depending on how we cook with them. For example, if you Google around online, you'll find many articles stating that those additional 100 compounds contained in real vanilla extract or paste will burn off at high enough temperatures such as in pancakes, cookies, or cakes, and actually taste flavorless compared to the higher concentrated vanillin in imitation vanilla flavoring that I found cloying and overpowering in this test. And I've seen some tests of imitation versus real vanilla extract, but I haven't seen anyone add in different form factors like vanilla powder or vanilla paste and trying some different vanilla extracts like this one, which is from Mexico. For me, I'm thinking maybe the flex in the viscous vanilla paste may hold on to its flavor better when cooked compared to the pure liquid form or that Mexican vanilla could lose more or less flavor than the Madagascan. However, before we jump into the next two tests, I want to explain a little bit more about these form vectors and go deeper into how aroma molecules work because understanding these really change about how I think about using vanilla when I'm cooking with it. As noted in the flavor equation by Nick Sharma, aroma molecules have these three characteristics. First, they are small and light in weight and lighter molecules travel faster through air. Secondly, they are volatile at room temperature so they can travel through the air to the nose. And then third, they can talk with our odor receptors. And then building on that, aroma molecules are typically classified into three categories. You have the top notes or the head notes, and these are the first aromas you detect and also the ones that fade away immediately. Secondly, you have the middle notes, and these are the main aromas you detect after the top notes. Third, you have the bottom notes, and these are the notes that you detect for a long time. Now, it's fair to point out that of the three or 400 aroma molecules that have been identified in vanilla, most of these are probably imperceptible to the average person or super subtle and extremely volatile, so they get lost to the air as soon as I open up this pod. Now, as noted in On Food and Cooking, the top notes in vanilla are primary linalool, the middle notes are made up of eugenol, cresol, and guaiacol, and the base notes, of course, are orvanilin. And I don't have the exact concentration percentages, but again, the imitation likely has a significantly higher vanillin concentration, but it's missing out on all those other flavor notes that are sometimes described as woody, floral, tobacco, clove-like, honey-like, earthy, smoky, and buttery. And straight up, just a sniff of a vanilla bean is absolutely intoxicating. And there is so much more going on in here than just your imitation vanilla. But this kind of got me to wondering, you know, 
If vanilla beans have the most depth and complexity, why do we turn vanilla beans into extracts and paste in the first place? And I'll answer that after experiment number two, because the conclusion tees this up quite nicely. For the pancake test, I used the same five products from experiment number one, except I added a new one, and that is vanilla scraped straight from the vanilla bean to see how much flavor it would impart into the batter. For this, I made one mother pancake batter, and the dry ingredients, which were 500 grams of flour, 100 grams of sugar, 10 grams of salt, and 15 grams of baking powder. Now for the wet stuff, I added four eggs, 100 grams of heavy cream, 400 grams of water, and some oil to a bowl before whipping it up. Then I combined the wet into the dry and created the batter. Once combined, I separated the batter out into 100 gram portions, and for each of these, I added one gram of each vanilla product of choice, which was the Mexican vanilla extract, the Madagascar vanilla extract, the vanilla paste, vanilla powder, vanilla flavoring, and then lastly, I did the insides from one half of a vanilla bean, which it cost me $16 for two vanilla beans, so this is $4 worth of raw vanilla in a single pancake. Then I cooked each of the pancakes on the griddle and transferred them to the large cutting board where we can give them a taste test. So if six different pancakes weren't enough, I'm gonna add one more. This is actually one without any vanilla, so I felt like this would be kind of a cool kind of control to add to this test. But let me blindfold up and see if I can tell any difference between all of these different pancakes, including the one that has half of vanilla bean, which is like, four to five dollars worth. Um, so let me blindfold up and uh, see what we find. Two, three, all right, let me shimmy these up. And we're going in with no syrup. I feel like, I feel like syrup is just gonna muddy everything up even more than it already is. All right, number one. Maybe not getting much from this one? I'm gonna come back to that just to double check, but I feel like I didn't get much from that. All right, number two. Okay, I'm definitely picking up on some vanilla in this. Hmm. All right, there's definitely vanilla in this one. That first one, I might just be the plain one. Um, we, we shall see. If I had to guess off the bat, I think this might be the imitation or the vanilla powder but I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going through. Vanilla in this, for sure. I don't know, not getting much from that one. Three, four, okay. I mean, it smells like vanilla. Hmm. I like this one better. I don't know specifically what about that. Let me keep going. But I kind of like that one the best so far. That's not super fragrant. Nothing too special about that one, I would say. I don't think I really have much to tell you. There's definitely some vanilla in that one, but it's not very strong. Gonna move to the last one. Yeah, I feel like there's not much to these last two. Let me go back to number one. I mean, I really hope I'm not wrong, but number one, I'm almost assuredly has gotta be the plain one. And then I think number four was my favorite. I wanna come back to that one. Come back to number three. So number one, I'm pretty sure is the plain one. It's the only one that like, just doesn't have any taste to it. These other six are all solid. The only one that stands out to me, and it's just by like a tiny, tiny bit, I would say is number four. Um, numbers six and seven definitely felt like they were lacking a little bit. Um, but 
two through seven, all good. None of them bad. The only one that maybe is a slight, slight step above is number four. So I'm going to see what we got here. All right. Number one, plain. Okay. So it's very obvious when there's not vanilla, um, which is one thing I'm learning as I've been doing these tests. Number two is the imitation. Okay. Number three, Madagascar. Number four, Mexico vanilla extract. Interesting. Number five is the paste. Number six is the vanilla bean. Number seven is the vanilla powder. That is crazy. Okay, so this is like kind of crazy to me. And I think it shows the power of the extract. Like this, this one with the vanilla bean, you can see little flecks of vanilla all over it. And obviously you can't see anything with this, but you really don't get much vanilla from this vanilla bean. And specifically this Mexican um, vanilla extract is the only one that really feels like a slight step above these other ones. Um, I would say the vanilla bean is probably the worst of these other than the plain one. Um, and then yeah, vanilla powder, paste, all fairly similar, other real vanilla. But yeah, the Mexican one is really the only one that stands out to me as like a little bit better. But I think the real shocker from this is using half of a vanilla bean. We're talking like four or five dollars worth of vanilla beans here in a single pancake. And that still is not able to like overpower the flavor, which really to me showcases the power of using vanilla in an extract. Super, super interesting. So to my surprise, the pure vanilla bean insides, even though we can see all of these beautiful flecks of vanilla loaded in that batter, actually made almost no impact on the flavor of the pancake, and it was definitely the worst of the bunch. And this really highlights the problem that you need to figure out when using real vanilla beans at home, and that is how do you optimize the flavor extraction from the vanilla bean? Remember, since aroma molecules are highly volatile and they can travel through air, this creates two issues. First is that as soon as the cured vanilla bean is opened, it loses its aroma compounds to the air and some of those are gonna be gone forever. And secondly, of those that do remain, it's really hard to extract the full breadth and concentration of the aroma molecules from the vanilla bean. And these issues might be the reasons why making your own vanilla extract at home could be seen as a waste of time. For example, as Stella Parks notes in this article, commercial extracts can be made via hot or cold extraction. There can be an alcohol wash at varying percentages. You can have a pressurized extraction or percolation. And each producer will do it a little bit differently, but these processes result in bringing out the most dynamic range from the vanilla bean and it's really not a replacement for just dropping a couple of beans into a jar with your vodka because that creates an infusion rather than a true extraction. Also, you may be wondering why does vanilla extract use alcohol in the first place? Because it's kind of weird that you don't need to be carded for something that has a 35% alcohol mixture inside it. And as noted in On Food and Cooking, from a chemical standpoint, the alcohol used in vanilla extract binds to the aroma molecules like vanillin and inhibits their release into the air, so it's a way to preserve the flavor. And this is why on a bottle of real vanilla extract, there must be 35% of alcohol added, and for the imitation too, you'll find it has a smaller percentage as well. So to end out this video, there's still a couple of questions I want to know as we move into the chocolate chip cookie test. And that is, one, does the increased cooking time in a cookie make the imitation vanilla more prominent than the others? And secondly, does the Mexican vanilla extract still taste noticeably better like it did in the pancakes? Now, before the final chocolate chip cookie test, thank you again to Geico for sponsoring today's episode. I'm partnering with Geico this year to explore meals and topics that could save you time and money in the kitchen without compromising quality. So check out the link below to see how you could bundle and save with Geico. But now let's do the final test test and see how these vanillas stack up in some chocolate chip cookies. 
I followed one of the quick chocolate chip cookie recipes from Serious Eats, where again, I prepped one large mother cookie dough before separating them into even 85 gram portions and adding one gram of vanilla per portion before mixing them and separating them into individual cookies. Then I laid out the cookies onto the baking sheet, baked them at 350 degrees Fahrenheit, and it's taste test time. And this is the one where most people say the imitation vanilla forms better than the real stuff, so let's see how that stacks up. Okay, so we've got our five cookies. I'm going to blindfold, shuffle them, and uh, see if there are any differences by just changing the single ingredient of vanilla. Whew, nothing like warm cookies. All right, cookie number one. Smells test. Smells like a cookie. I almost think that might be the imitation vanilla right off the bat. We'll see. Cookie number two. Again, smells like a cookie. Oh no. Okay. Okay. Cookie number three. Smells like a cookie. Pretty neutral tasting. Um, I still think number two has like a deeper depth of like vanilla flavor coming through on it. Two, three, four. God. Smells like a cookie again. Number four. Number four, good all around cooking cookie. I don't know if I really picked up on anything in that one though. Cookie number four. Or five. Again, cookie. Number five was definitely good. I wanna go back to number one though. Okay, so all of these taste good. Um, again, as we've talked about, this is kind of a nuanced thing and like without vanilla, these still are chocolate chip cookies. Though I will say vanilla definitely enhances the batter so much. Like if you taste it with and without, vanilla, it's crazy just how much better vanilla makes it. That being said, there are two things that I think I can pick up on. I think number one is imitation. Um, it has that kind of taste that reminded me of the frosting test. And then number two, I think is the uh, Mexican vanilla extract. Um, it had like kind of that deeper earthy tones, which I kind of also remembered from the frosting test. These other three are definitely pretty solid, but there's nothing that like really sticks out to me. And even these I'm not that sure on, so let's just give them a look. So this was not the imitation. This is the vanilla powder. This is the imitation, which I felt like, these two were the only ones where I felt they were significantly different. And I wouldn't say necessarily in a good way, um, but I definitely did notice it different. These three, which was the Madagascar, Mexico, and the paste, I couldn't really distinguish anything from these three. These two were the only ones that I actually picked up on anything from. And actually, let me give me this another taste. The vanilla powder, I actually feel like does come through and it, it kind of reminds me of like the imitation um, from the frosting test. And then the imitation definitely like has a very distinctive, like there's vanilla in this cookie. Like it's, it feels like it's deeper and it definitely lingers around longer, which again, probably due to that extra vanilla. So in short, is real vanilla actually worth it? Well, for me, I think if it fits in the budget, buying, you know, a 10 or $12 bottle of the real stuff is definitely worth it, especially when you figure out that you probably buy this about once per year, depending on the bottle size and how much you use vanilla. 
That being said, I wanted to go through some of these pros and cons so you can make a confident purchasing decision because I'll tell you one thing, I'm definitely not afraid to use imitation vanilla. When it comes to vanilla beans, they have the most complexity and depth when you smell them, but in practice at home, it's the most expensive and it's really hard to extract the full flavor from the beans. Now, a pro for vanilla extract is that it's a highly concentrated source of vanillin and the other aroma compounds, giving it added complexity, but it's gonna be more expensive and that flavor can be altered through high heat and cooking. Now, a pro for the imitation vanilla is that it's the cheapest and highest concentration of vanillin, but it can be overpowering in frostings, custards, creams, or similar dishes. Now, a pro for vanilla paste, it has those beautiful flecks which look really, really nice, but both the paste and vanilla powder do have added sugar which may or may not be desirable depending on what you were using them for. And in short, when evaluating these, I would ask yourself, are you using the vanilla to stand on its own or provide a general aromatic lift? And then secondly, are you using this in something that is cooked or hot? And then figure out where you can add it. Can it be added before, during, and after cooking to amplify and optimize the vanilla taste? And then you can figure out which of these products are going to work best for you. Now, while I would have a tough time recommending buying vanilla beans for the average home cook or someone like me who doesn't bake that often, if you are into baking or pastry or you're a pastry chef or something, you are gonna know how to get the best out of this vanilla bean and use it in a way that really optimizes that flavor. And if you've never bought one of these, I would highly recommend it because they are just so, so, they just smell so good. I can't get over it. And you never know what you may be inspired to make. But anyway, that is going to wrap it up for me in this one. I will catch you all in the next one. Peace, y'all.